Earnings per share or EPS is an important metric and must be shown on the face of the income statement. It depicts the earnings per ordinary share. Ordinary shares are subordinate to all other types of equity. You might hear the term preferred shares or preference shares get dividends before ordinary shares. Ordinary shares are also called common shares or common stock. In terms of a simple formula, we can say that EPS is equal to the income available to ordinary shareholders divided by the number of ordinary shares. What if a company has issued securities which are convertible to ordinary shares? Examples of such securities would be convertible bonds. So if a company has issued a bond with a par value of 1000, and let's say that this bond is convertible into 50 common shares. This is called a convertible bond or a company might issue a convertible preferred stock. Employee stock options are also options which can be exercised by employees and then the company has to issue new shares. Notice that with these convertible securities, there is a possibility that they will be converted, which would mean that the number of common shares will go up. In other words, the denominator over here would go up. And these convertible securities also have an impact on the numerator, which we will see over the next few slides. But there is a chance that because of the increase in the denominator, the EPS is reduced or diluted. If this can happen, then we say that these securities are potentially dilutive. We say potentially dilutive because occasionally the impact of a particular convertible security might actually be anti-dilutive, which we will see later. When a company has securities which are convertible to ordinary shares, it is said to have a complex capital structure. So if any of these exist, then the company has a complex capital structure. If a company does not have convertible securities, then we say that it has a simple capital structure. Back to the formula for EPS. We will first look at a concept called basic EPS and later we will look at diluted EPS. Basic EPS is equal to net income minus preferred dividend divided by the weighted average outstanding shares. The net income as we have seen earlier is the revenue minus all expenses and this includes operating expenses, non-operating expenses such as interest. We also subtract taxes and then we are left with net income. This is the money available to all shareholders. But the concept of EPS is the earnings available to ordinary shareholders on a per share basis. So from the net income, we need to subtract the preferred dividend to see what is available to common shareholders or ordinary shareholders. That's why in the numerator, we subtract the preferred dividend. This gives us the income available to common shareholders over a given period, let's say for the year 2010. We then have to divide by the weighted average shares outstanding. We say weighted average shares outstanding because the number of shares outstanding over the year is not necessarily static. If a company has uh, 100,000 shares outstanding at the start of the year, and then in the middle of the year, let's say on 1st July, the company issues 20,000 new shares, which would mean that for the second half of the year, the company has 120,000 shares outstanding. What should our denominator then be? The answer is we need to use the weighted average. In this case, we have 100,000 for half the year. So we say 100,000 into 0 0.5 or 6 over 12 plus 120,000 into 
zero point five again. And when you find the weighted average of these two numbers, you will get a hundred and ten thousand. In my simple example, that would be the denominator. Let's say that our net income was two hundred thousand. And let's say for simplicity that the preferred dividend was ninety thousand. Then our basic EPS would be two hundred thousand minus ninety thousand, which is hundred and ten thousand, divided by hundred and ten thousand, which is equal to one. So the earnings per share in this example equal one. We'll do a few examples now, which will help you understand the concept. For twenty ten, Gigli Limited had net income of two hundred thousand. Fifty thousand was the dividend paid to preferred shareholders, and twenty-five thousand was paid to common shareholders. And then we are also given the number of shares outstanding. What is the basic EPS? The first thing you need to do here is write down the formula. The formula for basic EPS is equal to net income minus preferred dividend divided by weighted average number of shares outstanding the net income is 200000 the preferred dividend is 50000 so we subtract 50000 notice that we are not supposed to subtract the dividend for common shareholders the reason is in the numerator we are simply using the total amount of money that is available to common shareholders it is the common shareholders or the board that then essentially decides how much of this is paid as a dividend to common shareholders that decision of how much dividend to pay to common shareholders does not impact the basic eps so we ignore the dividend paid to common shareholders when we do a basic eps calculation we need to also compute the weighted average number of shares outstanding we had 75000 at the start of the year and this was the number of shares that we had for 6 months so we multiply this by 6 over 12 and then for the second half of the year we had 15000 shares which means that we then had a total of 90000 75000 plus the new 15000 gives us 90000 this was the number of shares outstanding for the second half of the year so we multiply this also by 6 over 12 effectively we are computing the average 75000 into 0.5 plus 90000 into 0.5 this gives us 82500 which represents the weighted average number of shares outstanding in 2010 and then coming back to our original formula we have 150000 in the numerator that's the amount of money available to common shareholders divided by 82500 which is about 1.8 so the basic eps is 1.8 let's make the question a little more complicated now In 2011 the net income was 300000 50000 was paid to preferred shareholders and 25000 to common shareholders and we are also given this information shares outstanding at the start of the year 90000 then 15000 new shares were issued the company also repurchased shares this is called a treasury stock operation and there was a 2 for 1 split on december 1st 2011 what is the basic eps let me just clarify what we mean by a 2 for 1 split this means that if a given company has issued a stock that is trading for 20 dollars a 2 for 1 split would mean that this one stock worth 20 is now equal to two stocks that's where the 2 for 1 comes from two stocks each worth 10 economically there is no difference if you had one stock before worth 20 now your net worth is still the same you only have two stocks where each stock is worth 10
the number of shares has doubled, but the value of each share is now half of what it used to be. Whenever you see a stock split, what you need to do is adjust all numbers prior to the split based on the type of split. Here we have a two for one split, which means that as you start working back, a repurchase of 30,000 based on this new split is really a repurchase of 60,000. The shares issued 15,000 really means that according to a split number, this would be 30,000 and 90,000 would be rewritten as 180,000. To figure out the weighted average number of shares outstanding, we need to do the following. Initially, the company had 180,000 shares outstanding, and these were outstanding from 1st January to 31st March, which is three months out of 12. So we say 180,000 for three months out of 12. And then 30,000 new shares, this is based on our split, were issued. And that means that we now have 210,000 shares outstanding. These were outstanding from 1st April till October 1st, which is six months. Therefore, we write 210,000 into six months out of the 12-month year. And then for the last three months, we actually are going to come down by 60 because 60,000 shares were repurchased. That means in the last three months, we have 150,000 shares, 150,000 into 3 over 12. Whenever you do this calculation, these numbers need to add up to 12. If you do this calculation, you should get 187,500. And then going back to our formula, the basic EPS is equal to the net income of 300,000 minus the preferred dividend of 50,000 divided by the weighted average number of shares outstanding, which is 187,500. If you do the calculation, what you should get is 1.33. We now come to the slightly more complicated concept of diluted EPS. Diluted EPS, we compute diluted EPS using the if converted method. If you recall, we talked about the concept of convertible securities such as convertible bonds, convertible preferred shares and so on. Now we compute diluted EPS by saying that if the convertible securities were actually converted, then what would the EPS be? If you take a convertible preferred stock, then assuming that convertible preferred stock is converted, there would be an impact on the net income available to common shareholders. So we need to compute that net income. And then in the denominator, there would be an increase in the number of common shares outstanding because of the conversion and that also needs to be accounted for. So let's look at a few examples now where we will compute the diluted EPS. We are given the net income which is 750,000 and we are also told that the company has 50,000 shares outstanding and convertible preferred stock 10,000 shares. Each share of preferred stock pays a dollar for dividend and is convertible into four shares of common stock. What is the estimated basic and diluted EPS for the company? The basic EPS should be easy. We take the net income of 750,000 and we subtract the preferred dividend, which is 4 into 40,000. So that is 4 into 10,000. So that is 40,000 divided by the number of shares outstanding, which is 50,000. Here we are making a simplistic assumption that 
the number of shares outstanding is 50,000 throughout the year. Our basic EPS is then 14.2. To compute the diluted EPS, we assume that the convertible preferred stock is actually converted. What then will happen to the numerator? We have a net income of 750,000 and obviously if the preferred shares are converted then we do not need to pay any dividends to preferred shareholders so the minus 40,000 goes away and we are simply left with 750,000 but the denominator is going to go up the denominator is going to be 50,000 which is the original number of shares outstanding plus the new number of common shares outstanding which is going to be 10,000 multiplied by 4 because each preferred stock is convertible into 4 shares of common stock. So here we add 40,000. It is simply a coincidence that the dividend and the number of shares that we convert into is the same. 10,000 into 4 gives us 40,000 when you solve you should get 8.33 so this is the diluted eps notice that it is much lower than the basic eps so substantial dilution takes place assuming the preferred stock is converted into common stock consider another example now net income is 500000 capital structure is as follows we have a weighted average number of stocks outstanding for 2011 equal to 45000 200 convertible bonds each with dollar 100 par value and 10% coupon convertible to 20 shares 15000 non convertible preferred shares each paying a 2 dollar dividend we are given the tax rate what is the basic and diluted EPS? Before looking at the answer, I want you to try and solve this. The basic EPS is straightforward. It's the net income minus preferred dividend divided by the weighted average number of shares outstanding. And that is 10.44. The diluted EPS is a little more complicated. So we need to look at the income available to common shareholders assuming that the convertible bonds are converted note that the preferred shares here now are non convertible we start with the net income which is 500000 and notice if the convertible bond is converted into stock then obviously the company does not have to pay the interest amount or the coupon amount the coupon amount had been subtracted when we created or when we computed the net income. So that amount needs to be added back on an after-tax basis. The 2000 is the interest expense. And you can see that 200 convertible bonds, each with par value 200. So that's 200 into 100. That is the total par value of the convertible bonds. The interest or the coupon is 10%, so you multiply that by 10% or 0.1 and you will get 2000. Remember that interest is tax deductible. To come up with the after tax effect, we do 2000 into 1 minus the tax rate, which is 0.4. And this expression is shown right here. We add it back because this amount is not going to be paid anymore so the net income would be higher the dividend to preferred shareholders still needs to go out because those are non-convertible the preferred shares are non-convertible so we subtract 30,000 which is 15,000 into 2 subtract 30,000 and then divide by 45,000, which is the original number of shares outstanding. And when we have these 200 convertible bonds, each converted into 20 shares, we will have 4,000 more common shares. You do the maths and you should get 
a diluted EPS equal to 9.6. Here again, there is a dilution taking place. Now let's consider an example which involves employee stock options. Net income 600,000. Weighted average number of shares is now 150,000. The company had issued 10,000 employee stock options with an exercise price of 40. Over the year, the average market price for the share was 50. What is the basic and diluted EPS for Traveling Trains Limited? Before we solve this problem, I will just help you understand what we mean by a employee stock option. And this will make even more sense later in the course when you study financial derivatives. Sometimes companies issue options to their senior management and a option very simplistically says the following. The company says to management that, look, we are giving you the option to buy the company's share for a certain price. That certain price is called the exercise price. That exercise price in our particular example is 40. This is an incentive for management to do really well because if they can get the company to perform well and the stock price goes up, then the management will be well off because they can get a stock from the company for only 40 and that stock is worth 50 in the market. So this serves as an incentive for management to maximize the value of the firm. Coming now to our example. First, let's calculate the basic EPS. And by now, you should be really good at this. The net income is 600,000. Here, we don't have any preferred shares, so nothing to subtract. And then we divide by the number of shares outstanding, which is 150,000. The basic EPS is 4. What about the diluted EPS? Again, we start with 600,000 in the numerator. When the options are exercised, what happens is the employees come to the company and they submit their 10,000 options. And in return, the company issues 10,000 new shares and gives them to the employees. So as far as the numerator is concerned, there is no difference. The numerator is still 600,000, that is still the total amount of money available to common shareholders. There will be an impact on the denominator. We start out with 150,000 shares outstanding, and then we are going to add the number of new shares. And this is a little bit interesting. The company has to issue 10,000 new shares because employees are coming in and exercising their options. But as discussed earlier, when the employees exercise their options, they have to actually pay $40 to exercise each option and get a share. So how much money does the company make? The company will make 40, which is the amount on a per share basis, times the number of shares which are issued, that is 10,000. Overall, the company will make 400,000. The assumption now is that in order to minimize dilution, the company will take this 40,000 and buy back shares from the market. So how many shares will be bought back? 40,000 is the amount of money the company has. The stock price in the market is 50. So the number of shares that will be bought back equals 400,000 divided by 50 which is equal to 8,000. Now let's look at the net effect. The company issued 10,000 shares, so that's 10,000 more shares, but then the company actually bought back 8,000 shares. So that means the net effect is 10,000 minus 8,000, which is equal to 2,000. So overall impact is that 2,000 new shares were issued. That's the net effect. So we add 2,000 over here. 
and we compute the diluted EPS. The answer is 3.95. Here again, notice that there is dilution taking place. The basic EPS was 4 and the diluted EPS is 3.95. Some convertible securities could be anti-dilutive. Anti-dilutive securities are not included in the calculation of diluted EPS. This is because diluted EPS reflects the maximum potential dilution. Consider this example. Net income is 1.75 million, 500,000 shares outstanding. 20,000 convertible preferred shares, each paying $10 dividend and convertible to three shares of common stock. Compute the basic and diluted EPS. We have been through these sorts of calculations before. And when you calculate the basic EPS, you should get 3.10. And when you calculate the diluted EPS or if you assume that the shares are actually converted then what do you get? Assuming the convertible preferred shares are converted into common stock then your net income available to common shareholders is 1.75 million. The number of shares outstanding would be 500,000 plus 60,000. So you get 3.125. Notice that this number is larger than the basic EPS that you calculated. When this happens, then you report diluted EPS as 3.1 and not 3.125. It would make no sense to give a diluted EPS that is larger than the basic EPS. And that goes back to our comment here that diluted EPS reflects maximum possible dilution. These securities then are actually anti-dilutive.